Hello, my dark darlings. I'm Markia, and this is the Something Scary Podcast. To our veteran listeners and those sheltering into the dark with us for the first time, welcome. We're going to do something a little bit different for you this week. You know how during our live streams, and for those that don't know, we have a live stream uh, the last Wednesday of every month at 3 p.m. Pacific time. One of the questions that tends to come up is, you know, what crystals am I using? What are my protection stones? We want to give you some true supernatural tales this time, just so that you know an inkling of why you too should do protection stones. And for those that ask, black tourmaline is, uh, along with uh, stones like onyx. You can also do fool's gold, also known as pyrite, is a really good protection and also a prosperous stone, amongst others. But remember, allowing yourself to be a conduit to the energies around you is a bold choice. Be careful. Taking the path less traveled is adventurous, but attuning yourself with the right energy is key. Take protective measures, respect the spaces you move through, because if you don't, you can open yourself up to horrors beyond your imagination. Today, we explore true supernatural tales. First, beware what you awaken when you trespass. Next, not all family gifts are blessings. After that, death follows from birth. And finally, we discuss the harrowing event of the suitcase found on Randonautica. So make sure you listen all the way to the end. I receive hundreds of creepy story submissions every single week. As always, the first story you hear is one that we've chosen to animate and post over at youtube.com snarled. Then I read a few more stories for the podcast. If you have a tale you're dying to share, send me an email at somethingscary@snarl.com. And if you'd like to support Something Scary, consider joining our Patreon. As a patron, you can help the show and also be a part of it. Hear your name featured in a story on the podcast or weekly video, and see ad-free episodes. For more information, visit patreon.com slash snarled. So, want to hear something scary? Ghost Warriors of Hawaii. When visiting places, always be mindful of the culture you're being welcomed into. Ignorance is no excuse if you trespass sacred customs. You will always face the consequences of your actions. We continue in a world previously touched upon in our Ghosts of War 2 audio podcast. Beware the Night Marchers of Oahu. A few years ago, a young woman named Ophelia managed to sneak into a restricted part of Kualoa Ranch on the Hawaiian island of Oahu. It was the last afternoon of her trip to Hawaii, and she wanted to do something daring to cap off an amazing week. Before sunset, she wandered away from her tour group in search of lava rocks. She wanted to bring one back with her as a souvenir, a real piece of the island. That and maybe catch a glimpse of the Night Marchers, the ghost warriors of Oahu. Years ago, her friend Trent had been trying to catch them on camera, but disappeared right after. But maybe she'd be luckier. As she wandered deeper and deeper into the ranch, she soon found herself standing in a thicket away from any sort of trail, near a river. In it, she found the rocks she'd been looking for. Might as well she figured, and took a solid lava stone to bring home with her. In the distance, she heard drumming, and somewhere beyond the trees, she made out shadows of approaching figures. Could it be the night marchers of Hawaiian legend, materializing as the sun began to set? She wondered this to herself, pulling her phone out, prepared to take pictures. As soon as she pulled it out, the auto flash erupted from the device, startling her, making her drop her camera to the ground. Her screen was cracked when she picked it up. Fumbling, she tried to pull up an overhead map, but stopped when she noticed a shadowy movement. It was in the reflection behind her, in the darkened part of the broken screen. A lone figure was coming toward her through the jungle. They wore feathered adornments and carried a spear. Had she stumbled into a gathering of some kind? Worried she'd be caught trespassing, she quickly lunged away. Her tour group leader would have definitely noticed by now that she was missing. 
A breeze picked up, turning into a blazing hot wind. It carried the scent of sulfur, of death. Coughing, she glanced down in horror as the dirt cracked beneath her feet, zigzagging up an embankment, and lava began to seep out of the top of the rift toward her. Fog snaked itself amongst the trees. She squinted her eyes and saw little lights floating towards her. The closer they came, the more her body filled with dread. The lights took shape. They were flames. Flames dancing on torches. A shadowed crowd was holding them aloft. That's when a figure emerged from their shadowy depths. It was the lone figure from before. He wore a feathered cape and helmet and carried a spear. No, he bellowed. Unsure of what he wanted, Ophelia ran through the foggy jungle. She stopped to catch her breath. Was she imagining things? Just then, her phone began to ring. It was Allie, the tour group leader. Where are you? she demanded. Ophelia told her everything that had happened and the phone became deadly quiet. You took what's his. The night marchers are protective of their sacred land. They come from the north, down the mountain to the ocean to find their next battle. And you just picked one, Allie said. That's why we warn tourists to avoid certain areas. You need to get out of there. If you come across another apparition, lie face down as a sign of respect. If you look directly at them, they will hunt. The call dropped. It was too late. I've already looked directly at them, she thought, just as her gaze raised up to meet the tip of a spear. Feeling the weight of the rock in her pocket, Ophelia reached for it. Please, I'm sorry. She looked at the ground. Steam rose from it as creeping lava snaked through it, closing in on her. Laying on the ground in respect wasn't an option. Not now. Fearing for her life, Ophelia backed away into the fog, holding the lava rock out and in desperation even aims to fling it towards the ghostly warrior. I'm sorry, please, just take it. Ophelia flailed and slipped as she stepped backward, still holding the rock as she tumbled off the edge of a cliff behind her. She was found the next day washed ashore from the rocky sea she'd fallen into, lying face down, her hand still clutching the misbegotten stone. The native examiners from that region took one look at her and surmised her real cause of death, as the lava rock was quietly returned to its rightful place. Her death served as a reminder to never desecrate the places you visit. Or you might awaken ancient protectors, just like the Night Marchers of Oahu. A few weeks back, I became a Thrive Market member. They're delivering organic and sustainable groceries right to my door. I'm really looking forward to making some delicious frosting and cupcakes using the Thrive Market products I got. Organic heavy coconut cream, large unbleached baking cups, and wholesome organic cane sugar. There'll be more than enough for me and friends. I can't imagine shopping for my supplements or organic face and beauty products any other way. Once you try Thrive Market, you'll love it as much as I do. Here's why. Thrive Market tailors to over 70 different diets and values like paleo to keto to plant-based. Not only are products searchable by diet, but as a member, I'm saving 25 to 50% off of traditional retail prices. And their carbon neutral shipping is free on orders over $49. I'm a proud Thrive Market member. You will be too. Try it risk-free. Go to thrivemarket.com slash scary. Join today and you'll get up to $20 in shopping credit towards your first order. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash scary to start your risk-free membership and get up to $20 towards your first order. Thrivemarket.com slash scary. Affinity for the supernatural can often be passed down within families. In this letter, Faith tells us her story of it continuing within her. My parents both had a childhood steeped in the supernatural. My mom was the youngest of 11. I remember the house she grew up in. A step up from dirt floors, electricity, and running water, but that's about it. Just an old wooden house in the piney woods of southeastern Texas. My mom told me about a lot of supernatural stuff that happened in that house. 
She said something would run its fingers through her and her siblings' hair at night and pull up the sheets to play with their toes. To this day, my uncle still wraps the sheets around his feet to prevent it. She said the same uncle got left home alone one day, and when they got back, he had barricaded himself into a room. It was the shadowy forms, he explained. They would watch him through the windows at night. It'd watch all of them. They were never sure if they were lurkers of the human variety or not. My dad is Louisiana Creole. His family has a gift, though I would debate calling it that. When his parents split, he went to live with his Creole grandparents. His mother married a white man and he adopted her kids and they gave up a lot of their cultural identity to assimilate to his will. And so it was something my generation was denied. I got this gift from him. He got it from his mom. His mom got it from hers and so on. There's about a million names for it, but basically we see spirits. Or maybe it is hereditary mental illness. I don't know much about my great-grandmother's experiences. She was dead by the time I was born. My grandmother would have encounters with a little girl from her childhood. She would vividly describe the pigtails and dress from the last century. It would follow her to school and church, always running up to hold her hand and catch up until her mother banished it, not believing it was what it said it was. It was no child. It was a demon taking a form to haunt my grandmother. My dad seemed to fare better with his experiences. I can kind of see why he thinks of it as a gift. He takes spirits on with confidence and authority. He would proclaim what the weather was going to be for the weekend, and it would be that in spite of what the forecast said. I remember what it was like to be little and under his protection, like an umbrella keeping the rain off. When my abilities presented themselves, however, it was cause for alarm. My mom said that during one of my earliest experiences, she found me and my sister perched on the furniture in the living room, giggling and following something with our eyes. When she asked what we were looking at, she said we told her there was a baby goat rolling around on the floor, and she thought it was funny till something bumped hard against the sofa neither one of us were on and knocked it back a bit. We kept giggling, and she called my grandmother in a panic. My sister saw some things too, but she was more of a prophet, seeing things in her dreams that always came true. She would tell my mom about her dreams, and she would have to call the people in them to give them a heads up, and everyone knew by that point to believe it. It got bad when I was a teenager, right after I had come out. I didn't know if I'd done something wrong, or if I was getting older and couldn't hide under daddy's umbrella anymore, to name a few things. A little girl started coming at night to sing lullabies to me. Then it escalated. Something started attacking me. When I would be drifting off, it'd jerk me awake and strangle me. I'd be yanked down the mattress by my ankles, and it'd grab my face and just scream at me. I'd be pinned to the headboard, and no one could hear it but me. It got to the point where I would just wait in my bed, wide awake until I deemed it long enough. And then I would go to my parents' room and crawl into my mother's arms just so I could feel safe enough to sleep. My father didn't get why I just couldn't handle it like he did. Just tell them to leave. You're stronger than them. The only power they have over you is what you're giving them with your fear. I tried. Believe me, I tried. But they didn't listen to me. I'm not my dad, and so I guess his solutions don't work for me. Instead of bugging them, I would read all night. I would rip through story after story, immersing myself into it so I could ignore what was happening in the real world where I was. And when the sun was up and my mom brewed her pot of coffee, I would sleep, curled up on the couch where I knew she could watch over me when I was at my most vulnerable. That didn't make the nights good, mind you. Ignoring what was going on in the room didn't mean it wasn't happening, and never being able to feel like you're alone is maddening in a way. To always hear whispers and footsteps following you as you wander the dark rooms of your house like a ghost. Finding something locked the door behind you when you came in, and feeling the panic as you unlock it and escape as fast as you can. Not feeling safe in your own home, and my family didn't like it. I still got my schoolwork done, but that didn't stop the nagging about staying up all night and sleeping all day. 
When I ran out of book budget and was sick of rereading, I found fan fiction, tons of free stories that I would never run out of, endless distraction, but my parents really didn't like me staying up on the computer, and later, my smartphone all night. Funny how even supernatural torment can become monotonous after a while. I tried religion. Some churches wanted you to let the Holy Spirit fill you up and take control. The congregation is happy to interpret a panic attack as the Holy Spirit having an effect. When Christianity didn't work, I tried a few other things, but to no avail. I don't really know what brought it to an end. Maybe it's the dogs that sleep in the bed with me at night. Maybe it's because I just got really good at ignoring them. Maybe they got bored. After a while, I started getting therapy and then antidepressants. I started processing everything now that it's over. I still encounter hostile spirits, of course, but none are attached to me. Sometimes a spirit visits, but I ignore it till it leaves. I don't trust them. Maybe there are good ones, but if they're nice enough, they'll leave me alone. I don't want this gift. I don't like shaking hands with people and feeling like I come back with part of their spirit clinging to me. I don't like being keenly aware of a room's energy and when a house doesn't want me in it. I don't like having this finely tuned survival instinct. It's not worth it for what I had to go through to get this good at it. I'm not going to have biological kids, and neither is my sister. I don't know if that will stop this from passing on, if it's tied to something in our genes. Mental illness or some actual supernatural gift. Faith, thank you so much for your letter to us today. I'm not able to touch on it in depth or often on what it can be like to be a person living in a world where energy attaches to you, spirits attach to you, where your gifts are a homing beacon for spirits and energy. So thank you so much for your letter that said that exact thing in a better way than I ever could. It feels like you found a certain kind of peace, and I hope that your peace continues, whatever feels best for you. For the rest of our listeners out there, if you have stories of gifts or foresight or communication with spirits, please send them to us. Something scary at snarled.com. We come into this world making our way to the same final destination. For some, the shadow of death might loom over our entire lives. Like in this narrative letter sent in by Mom to Heine. Dear Marquia, I'm one of the biggest Something Scary fans. I really like your channel and greatly enjoy hearing your stories in quarantine. Every week you publish new episodes and these stories have inspired me to write one. My name is Mamta Haina. I am a sixth grader in Bangladesh. I write short stories in my free time. My mother's name is Roshan Jahan, and this is her true story. I was 30 years old when my daughter, Mamta Haina, was born in the Holy Family Hospital. It was March of the year 2008. After she was born, she was settled in the hospital nursery. The hospital was mostly empty during the midsummer she was born. Only a few patients remained in the hospital, myself included. Solitude didn't bother me. As an introvert, I just liked to be alone. I knew my baby would be the same. She didn't really cry. She was calm and peaceful when she was moved with me during recovery. My personal chamber was small and had a single bed for me to rest on. There was nothing exceptional about the room, except that the room had a giant pane window attached to it. The window was white in color and had plain brown carvings. The window opened up to the small forest behind the hospital and the cemetery for the attached chapel. The cemetery was old and broken. Small and large tombstones lay broken on the overgrown grassy cemetery. Grave after grave was covered in grass, moss, and wild flowers. Long and small vines wrapped themselves around the tombstones and slithered over graves like a massive python. Looking at the cemetery, I was filled with chills and remember laughing at myself. 
The cemetery reminded me of every silly ghost story Granny had told me when I was little. She told me and my sisters about the tales of the undead roaming around in abandoned places and tales about the paranormal activities that happened in Granny's hostel. Back then, these stories had scared me greatly, but I knew they were probably the exaggerated ramblings of an old lady. Still, with lingering embarrassment, I remembered how I would recite religious verses from the Quran before going to bed so the banshee wouldn't snatch me away for being naughty. I decided, for the fun of it, that I would tell Mom Tahina these tales. That night, I had a strange dream. I dreamt that I was standing in the far corner of the cemetery. It was a full moon night, but the moon was hidden underneath thick clouds. Black figures danced around me as they spoke in cold, chattering voices. The figures looked human, but moved unnaturally. They seemed to glide and float around me with faces frozen in death, contorted in expressions of their last breath. I couldn't move or speak. I just stood there and watched them dance around me. After what seemed like hours, I finally unfroze, but my body felt cold and numb. My movements were clumsy and heavy. At that moment, a skeletal figure stepped forward and touched the base of my throat with its bony fingers. Immediately, a shiver ran through my body. His fingers were cold and felt as if they were made out of sharp ice shards clinging to my throat. It slowly tightened its grip and clutched my throat, cutting off the air. I woke with a start. <gasps> I sat up on my bed and gasped. I pulled the blankets off me and looked out the window. For a second, I was positive I had seen the skeletal figure standing right outside my window. When I blinked, the figure disappeared. After that incident, I kept having the same dream over and over again. And every time I woke up, I saw the same figure standing outside my window. Slowly, I started to get scared. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. My health started to get worse. Dark circles formed under my eyes and I started to lose weight. I could never fall asleep in the hospital before it was three in the morning. I feared falling asleep and dreaming. But no matter what I tried, I always fell asleep during three in the morning and dreamt the same thing over and over again. A few weeks later, I called up my mother and told her everything. My mom listened attentively and told me to wait for her. A few hours later, my mom entered my chamber with an imam of the nearby mosque. The imam blessed me and gave me an amulet and a bottle of holy water. He instructed me to drink the water and wear the amulet before going to bed. After that, he and my mom left the room. That night, I drank the water and wore the amulet before going to bed as instructed. It worked like a charm. That night, after weeks, I slept peacefully. But my peaceful sleep didn't last long. At around 3.30 in the morning, I woke up to a tapping sound. It was loud and clear. It was coming from the window. Unnerved by that sinister sound, I turned around. That was when I, for the first time, saw it. It had the figure of a woman. It had smooth, silky hair, and it wore a pale white dress. Its eye sockets were hollow and empty. It was tapping the window with its slender fingers elegantly. It spoke in an elegant and cold voice. Take off the amulet. Let me come in. No, I shuddered in a harsh voice, something inside me sending a wave of protective energy over my body. It started towards the window when a ray of light entered through the window. It dissolved into the sunlight. That was the last time I had seen it ever again, until it showed up outside the window of my daughter's room. We don't know what it wants, but it's followed us since her birth. Perhaps it's a guardian, or maybe it's here to collect us. Mom Tahaina, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us, your experience and also your mother's. It feels like you're both extremely connected. I know that we don't usually do this, but I wonder if anybody wants to reach out to us with what they think that this figure might be, an ancestor, a danger to them. 
if perhaps there's other things that they can think of to do more than ready to be the middle person on this to help mom to Heine and their mother in any way go ahead and email us something scary at snarl.com Recently, a group of teenagers went on a journey led by a popular app called Randonautica. What they found turned out to be far scarier than some of the stories we tell here. With that, what we are about to discuss is not a story inspired by our usual email messages, fan submitted fiction, or a tale based on true events. This is true crime. A true horror as reported, which is still a part of an ongoing investigation as of the time of this recording. Randonaut sent us to this part of the beach, and we found this black suitcase. The description read over at a Henry's quick TikTok, where his friends climbed down to some rocks by the shore of Alki Beach in Seattle, Washington. It was sunny out when they made their way to the nondescript suitcase that rested by the water. At a glance, it didn't look like more than just discarded litter, and the teens approached it hoping to find a suitcase with money. But as they got closer, they described an awful smell coming from it, and it dawned on them that things were far from ordinary. They were led there by an app called Randonautica, which is described by Wired magazine as a platform that will randomly use a number generator to produce specific coordinates within a set radius of your current location that you can travel to as a way of exploring the world around you. People gather these coordinates through Randonautica, where they can further define what they want to encounter. The app encourages users to set a personal intention before visiting a location in the hopes of uncovering synchronicities coincidences, or occurrences outside usual patterns of experience. This is not a role-playing game. This is real life inviting some real risks. Journeys are determined by three different types of locations after you put in your exact coordinates. The attractor leads to areas that carry immense energy. The void, which is described as the opposite of the attractor with low-density quantum point distribution. And finally, there's the anomaly location, which is best paired with a user that has a specific intention in mind. It's chaos theory meets quantum spirituality at the palm of your hand. Messing with the spiritual forces at play and technology is uncharted territory for strange occurrences. But the intrigue has blown up the app as an invitation to document the unexpected. Popular apps like TikTok have seen an influx of these sorts of videos which would be found using the hashtag Randonaut Challenge. And for the most part, it's just harmless fun. Harmless, which is what the teens on the beach expected when they were led to the suitcase in broad daylight. (laughs) The young woman in the video laughed as she poked the suitcase open with a stick, unleashing an even worse smell once the flap exposed what was inside. They looked at the black trash bags wrapped tightly around something possible body parts as the humor washed from their faces. Immediately, they retreated to inform authorities. In a statement released later on in the West Seattle blog, it was revealed that another bag was also found in the water and that the contents of both were determined to be human remains. The case is currently an active homicide investigation. The TikTok user at Ah Henry later expressed that he and his friends were in a state of shock and disbelief at what was unfolding. The moment I got back home, I broke down, he commented upon hearing the confirmation of the suitcase's contents. I still can't sleep. They have not posted since. We at Something Scary do not endorse this app and advise responsible usage under parental supervision and extreme caution if you're of age. If you do use it, please be safe, do not go alone, and don't set intentions with bad energy. There are too many forces out there that will all too happily oblige you. This week's podcast stories were edited by Marquia McCarty and Sabina Graves. Narration by Marquia McCarty. Audio edited by Fitz Harris and Calvin Linderman. Graphics by Johnny Ashley. Produced by Annalise Nelson. Music by Sapphire Sandalo. 
If you have a story you'd like to submit, send me an email at somethingscary@snarled.com. Don't forget to watch the video version of Something Scary over at youtube.com slash snarled. And if you'd like to support the show and everything we do at Snarled, join our Patreon at patreon.com slash snarled. Until next time, my dark darlings, sweet dreams. <laughs>